All right. Good evening and welcome to V Brown Bag. Uh, I'm your host, Rebecca Fitzhugh, and we're joined by a special guest this week, Tim Davis. Uh, we are continuing our VC, uh, excuse me, our VCAP, I was about to say our VCDX series, but it's our VCAP series uh, for vSphere 6 uh, DCB uh, design. So we're, we're, we're covering this week Objective 3.2, which is create a vSphere 6 uh, physical network design from an existing logical design. Um, so to kind of give you a heads up, next week we're actually going to take a little bit of a break from this series, and we're going to be doing a kind of a what's new with Nutanix AHV, and then we'll be back and resuming our, our uh, VCAP series the following week. So, uh, Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Tim Davis. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, at ALDTD, um, on Reddit at uh, U underscore VTimD. Um, I'm pretty much anywhere and everywhere in terms of community. Um, I work for VMware as an NSX systems engineer. Um, and in fact, as of the 18th of this month, it's been one year. Uh, previous to that, I was a vSphere and VDI architect with one of Dell Services' largest contracts. Cool. So as uh, aforementioned, I'm your host, Rebecca Fitzhugh. So you can see my Twitter handle uh, on the slide. I don't want to uh, even tr attempt to spell my name. I don't know how to spell it myself. Um, so, you know, make sure you join in on the conversation on Twitter. Uh, as throughout the session, you know, you feel free to tweet me questions or Tim questions, and we'll be monitoring that as we go through. Uh, so you can use at vbrownbag or hashtag vbrownbag. Um, so as mentioned, next week we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to uh, Nutanix for a week, and that'll be next Tuesday, um, and then we'll be back to the series. Uh, and then, of course, tune in tomorrow night for our uh, U.S. channel. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, to Tim and let him uh, lead the way here, if I can figure out how to work this thing. So here we go. You should be good to share your screen. So warning, you're now a presenter, so you might want to minimize all those things that I know you have pulled up. <laughs> <laughs> I already took care of that, don't worry. Sure. So show this window. Perfect. Can you see my PowerPoint? I can, yes. Beautiful. All right. All right. So as you said, we're going to go through um, uh, number 3.2 in the uh, the blueprint for the VCAP 6 DCB design exam. Um, we're going to be talking about the physical network design made from an existing logical design. So we're obviously going to build um, on the previous building blocks where you obviously learned about the differences between conceptual, logical, and physical. Um, and at this point in time in the blueprint, we're going to take all of that conceptual stuff and all that logical stuff and put it all together to kind of make some design decisions um, in the physical network design. Um, at this point, I'm also going to make a bunch of assumptions. Uh, there's a keyword that you guys learned all of those terms, um, such as assumptions, requirements, constraints, and all that. Um, and we're going to kind of use the VCDX or the VCAP design terminology um, to kind of bring everything together here. So let's take a look at the first step on the blueprint. And that's going to be analyzing VLAN options with respect to virtual and physical switches. Now, there is a ton of different design decisions that you can make in terms of VLANs um, with virtual switching and physical switching. Um, if you're going into an environment, a uh, brownfield environment, where you've got a bunch of servers and workloads and things like that that are already deployed and you're going to be migrating some of those workloads into your new design, you're already going to have a VLAN scheme or an IP scheme and stuff like that pretty much set up. Um, if it's a greenfield approach where you're designing it from scratch, then you kind of get to make a lot of those design decisions from scratch, but a lot of times you're going to be working with existing workloads um, or workloads that have already been planned out in that respect. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of decisions you can make um, in terms of physical VLANs going in. Um, you can configure ports on your ESX host as access ports, which means they allow just one VLAN through. And then you can create an uplink in one of your virtual switches for that 
you don't have to tag the VLAN at that point because the VLAN is already tagged at the switch. Um, one of the biggest design decisions that I've ever seen done, and I would put money down that most of the vSphere designs out there are set up where the physical switch port is basically trunking all either all of the available VLANs or all of the VLANs that are necessary down into the ESX host, and then the VLAN tagging is done at the virtual switch. Um, that is mostly the easiest way to get around uh, having to work with VLANs, and that makes it to where your ESX admin or your ESXi admins can go in and just start creating port groups that have the VLAN tag on them um, rather than having to go through to the network team and say, hey, we need a new VLAN and then have them trunk it down, add it to the trunk, and then create the port group. It just makes it easy. Um, that does also create some issues. Uh, if you were to say go and trunk all of the VLANs allowed all the way down to the ESX host, you're essentially throwing a ton of broadcast domains at the host. So all of those art packets and all those broadcast packets and everything are just sitting there hammering that host. If you kind of crank the VLANs down to where the only VLANs that are in that trunk are the ones that you know are going to be needed, you're cutting down a lot of that broadcast traffic. If you're going and just doing a single access port, then you know for a fact that the only VLAN going on that port is going to be the port that is uh, allowed for that. The issue with that is that you can't really push multiple VLANs worth of traffic on that one port. So you would have to say that one port goes to one uplink and then that's it. That's the only VLAN that goes through that. Uh, Rebecca, would you agree that you see a lot of people uh, pushing through and just basically trunking everything all the way down and then doing the uh, VLAN tagging at the virtual switch? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say most of the time, yeah, that's kind of the more standard configuration. But, um, you know, and everything you've said is absolutely correct. I would just sort of add that uh, it all kind of goes back to the requirements that we've set forth originally. So uh, you may have a requirement that says everything must be completely air gapped, you know, and then you're going, well, VLANs don't even matter uh, <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, or, you know, uh, you know, heaven forbid, you may have a requirement that kind of insinuates that you need to use PVLANs and then you have to start worrying about private <laughs> VLANs and then that really complicates your design. Um, so, uh, the I guess the ideal scenario is what you you described. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and just so everybody knows, I am definitely going to try to uh, to lean on Rebecca here a little bit um, to give me credibility as uh, she is the BCDX extraordinaire host here. Um, so it, it, exactly like she said, it definitely one hundred percent comes down to your requirements. Um, one of the biggest requirements that I see come through, um, and it's used as a crutch a lot, is uh, requirement 01, make it easy to manage. And they do that by simply trunking all the VLANs down. Um, but I've also seen some designs where security is a very, very tight concern. So they've even got it set up to where they've got certain VLANs that are going through on one physical port and another set of VLANs going through on another port, and that would be used for things like maybe DMZ zones and stuff like that. Um, so really, it all comes down to what your requirements are and how you can make those decisions for your VLANs based on the requirements that you have or the constraints that you have for that. So let's go. Given business requirements, de uh, determine the design for virtual network components. And this is going to be things like STP or spanning tree, uh, jumbo frames, load balancing, trunking, and link aggregation. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with spanning tree here. Um, for anybody that may not be 100% aware, um, spanning tree is used in just about every switching design I've ever seen or touched or worked with. And it was created to essentially cut out loops. And when you have a three-tier architecture, then you're essentially sitting there and moving the tree out. And when you connect certain things in certain ways, you can create loops in the network. And what spanning tree does is it actually learns all of the paths in your network, and it will be preventing loops in the network. 
But in order to do this, it actually blocks and cuts off certain switch ports. Um, and in really, really large environments, this can start to cause problems because you're essentially wasting switch ports on STP blocking. Um, and it also does cause problems where, let's say, it's blocking path B, but path A goes down. Spanning tree then has to completely recalculate the paths in order to make sure that there is one working path. This is network convergence. This can be anywhere from a couple of seconds to a whole bunch of couple of seconds, uh, depending on how big your network is and how everything works. Um, this is definitely something that is taken into consideration when making networking design decisions for how long is that recalculation time gonna take? How long can we withstand for it to take? Now there is um, a newer architecture in data center design these days called leaf spine, um, and that essentially makes everything a routing hop all the way down to the top of rack switch, so that every rack is essentially its own VLAN or its own subnet, and then you're routing absolutely everywhere. And there's routers at the top of rack going up to other routers in the middle. Those are spines, and the ones at the top of rack are leaf. Since you're doing routing everywhere, you actually don't have these loops like you would in a switching infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and with that, you can also use technologies such as equal cost multipathing to kind of give you resiliency in your network without having to waste ports like you would if you were using spanning tree. Jumbo frames. Um, jumbo frames is a kind of a big deal. There's a lot of design decisions around that. Um, one of the biggest ones I've seen is using IP storage. Uh, Jumbo frames is pretty much not necessarily a requirement for IP storage, but if you're doing high performance tuning and stuff like that, uh, it's definitely a, a best practice. Um, lots of switch manufacturers these days, um, while they do have a lot of stuff that defaults to the uh, 1500 MTU, a lot of them are kind of just throwing it out there and saying, well, here's 9000, we'll give you that, go for it. Um, <clears throat> jumbo frames just essentially takes, and instead of your 1500 byte MTU or frames that go through, it gives you that full 9000. So you've got a larger payload with a smaller, uh, with a single overhead as opposed to splitting it up, as you can see in the uh, depiction here. With um, jumbo frames, we see it also a lot in the NSX world. With NSX, um, doing virtual networking with VXLAN adds a 50 byte header to all of your frames. So rather than the standard 1500, we end up with about 1550 or so. Uh, we recommend a default frame size or MTU size of 1600 for NSX. But most of the time we see customers either have jumbo frames already enabled or they just go ahead and bump everything up all the way to 9000 just because they can. Um, there are also some networks that you will go into where making MTU changes across the board are flat out not possible for their network team. Um, you may give them a recommendation to go to jumbo frames, but you've got a constraint that says we have to stick with 1500. Uh, there are definitely ways to design around that, but it all depends on what your requirements and your constraints are going into your network design for what you pick. So this is where I will kind of differ from you a little bit, where I'll say, um, number one, I, I think the using, and this is just me, I told uh, Tim I was going to give him, sh oof, it's really hard to not say bad words. <laughs> I told yes. him I was going to give him a hard time. Uh, so here I am going to give him a hard time. Uh, I, I think using the term best practice is a crutch, uh, and we're all guilty of it. I, I, I you know, oh, yeah. I'm calling Tim out, but I do it. I do it too because sometimes it's just easier to say the words that people want to hear um, <laughs> instead of having to really sit, sit down and justify it. Um, so, in terms of jumbo frames being a best practice, um, I will say maybe right <laughs> because like there's a lot of considerations with jumbo frames. Uh, the big thing you have to take in mind is this is an end-to-end -end configuration. You can't just mm -hmm. configure this on your V switch and be like, "Yay, everything's good." Right, because especially if you're using a for IP storage, you have to go from ESXi host to physical switch, right, to storage array in your storage processors. Um, Absolutely right. So that would be like a big consideration of jumbo frames, and and Tim kind of hinted at it, 
but I'm going to break it down, you know, Barney style, as I like to say, the benefit of using jumbo frames uh, is to basically reduce the CPU overhead, right? It's easier for your processors to handle one large frame rather than a bunch of small frames, right? Mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of the benefit there. Um, is that a picture of Stone Temple Pilots? Yeah, I picked it for STP. <laughs> I, I figured, and I was just like, "Which one is Scott Weiland?" Like, I don't even recognize. I don't even. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a trivia question: Who who created the algorithm for STP? Ooh, Jeopardy. that's a great question. Uh, I would style. love to know the answer. It's a it's a it's a it's a lady. It's a lady named Radia Perlman. She wrote this like book. Also, like a long time ago. The only reason I know this is because I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> of course like, you did. Well, yeah, you know I'm a nerd. But uh, <laughs> it was like one of my first introductions into like Cisco networking, you know, 11 or 12 mm -hmm. years ago. And it was a book called like Interconnecting Cisco Devices. Um, and it was written by Radio Perlman. But anyway, she talks a lot about STP in there um, because she was the person who developed the algorithm. So for whatever reason, that, that trivia always stuck with me. That's awesome. I'll have to look that up. I, I've heard the name before. Um, if I heard the name other than you telling it to me, I wouldn't have been able to place it. But I definitely have heard that before. That's cool. Yeah. So now, like, I, I knew that you, I know you know a million times more about networking than me. So I was like, I got to get one over Tim. So there it was. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're, you're absolutely right. I used the term best practices when talking about, like, storage vendors and stuff. So how about vendor recommendations? I'll allow it. That? I'll allow Does it. Does that work better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Um, and you definitely said something that, that makes a lot of sense, and that's the fact that it is end-to-end. -end. So I've actually seen customers, um, we, we vendor recommend um, jumbo frames for NSX when you're doing really high-performance tuning and stuff like that. And we've seen customers that have taken every single physical interface, the virtual switch, everything, and just done jumbo frames. But then they've left their virtual machines where the, the VNIC pushing 1500, and they're wondering why nothing's happening. It's one of those things where you literally have to think, where is that packet originating from, and where is it its destination? So you can do every single interface, all your virtual switch, and everything. But if you leave 1500, sitting there on your virtual machine on the VNIC, it's going to sit there and it's going to split it into 1500, no matter how big the MTU is set on all the other devices. So you really, really have to take a look at that um, all the way through if you're really trying to take advantage of the jumbo frame. Absolutely. So uh, load balancing. <clears throat> load balancing for your virtual networking components um, this is not your traditional load balancing like F5 does. Um, specifically talking about load balancing for your virtual switches. Um, there's lots of different algorithms that you can do for load balancing. Um, if you wanted to, you could absolutely have a single NIC going in. Um, lots of customers love to put the requirement out that there's absolutely no single point of failures. Um, we know how that generally goes because you'll design every single thing with a redundant component and then they'll tell you, oh, there's not enough money left for a second site, so don't worry about it. Um, you know, it, it all comes down to what you're trying to accomplish. When it comes down to virtual switching, there's several different load balancing component or load balancing algorithms that you can pick. Um, route based on originating virtual port. Um, that's where the virtual switch selects uplinks based on the virtual machine port IDs on the uh, standard switch or distributed switch. Uh, there's also route based on source MAC hash, and that's where the virtual machine selects an uplink um, based on the MAC address for the virtual machine. Uh, it calculates that uplink. Um, the virtual, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the virtual switch uses the, uh, the MAC address and a number of uplinks in the team to kind of calculate which one it's going to use. Uh, route based on IP hash. Uh, this is where the virtual switch selects an uplink for the virtual machine based on the source and destination IP address of each packet, and it just kind of hashes those two and then selects the port based on that. Um, from what I've seen, that's a very popular option. That's used quite a bit. Uh, route based on physical NIC load. 
Um, this is uh, very common and very helpful if you have links that may possibly get saturated. So what that does is that actually selects the physical NIC route based on which port has the most load in it. And what it'll do is if it notices that one link is a little more saturated than the other, it'll kind of balance that traffic across and start using the other one to ensure that you don't have one link that's 100% saturated and one link that's like 5% saturated. So it'll just kind of keep an eye on what the traffic looks like for there. Um, there's also use explicit failover order. Um, this is really not load balancing at all. Um, all it's saying is it's got one active and one standby. You select which NIC you want to use for the active, and if that fails, it will go ahead and fail over to the second one. Um, trunking and uh, leak aggregation groups. Um, <clears throat> so doing things like LACP on your physical switch. Um, with link aggregation groups, you can kind of go ahead and set those up on the virtual distributed switch, and you can do things like LACP from the distributed switch, or you could do, say, LACP from the physical switch, where you're actually creating that port channel on the physical switch and then sending it across to your virtual distributed switch. Um, personally, for me, I prefer to let VDS do most of the work, um, and that's just because I'm a virtualization guy. Um, Really, it comes down to what your requirements and your constraints are. You've got some network teams that may tell you that the network team wants to handle all of the um, port channels. So they'll give you LACPs from the switch, and you'll have to just deal with those um, as a bonded single link into your VDS. Um, you may have some that say, we don't care. You can go ahead and select you know, LACP or whatever your teaming policy you want to do from the virtual distributed switch. Um, all of that comes down to whatever your requirements and your constraints are for that. Are there any uh, pros and cons for your load balancing policies? When you say pros and cons, like so let's with, like, things right. that may be better or worse? Yeah. Uh, honestly, it just comes down to what you're trying to accomplish. Um, there's some applications that don't necessarily like asynchronous traffic. So you may need traffic to go specifically in and out for each flow on one specific NIC. It all depends on what your application is for that. Um, if you've got a habit of saturating one link over the other, you may want to use something like a uh, route based on, or the uh, physical NIC load of the route base. <clears throat> Um, there's some requirements for NSX, let's say. Um, I'm going to use that a lot because obviously I know a tiny bit about it. Um, with NSX, if you're doing multiple VTEPs, there's specific load balancing algorithms that you flat out can't use with multiple VTEPs, um, such as physical NIC load. If you're using two VTEPs, you cannot use load balancing for that for multiple VTEP. So you would have to use, um, generally we use route based on IP hash for that. Um, so it really, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish with those specific uplinks. Okay, cool. Evaluate network redundancy considerations for a given design. Um, I just said a second ago, you've got customers that will tell you that they absolutely will not tolerate a single point of failure. Everything needs to be redundant. But then, of course, at the end of the whole design, they tell you there's no money left, so they can't buy a, you know, a, a second site. So you instantly have a single point of failure. Really, it comes down to what is actually necessary for your network. Um, do you absolutely have to have two of everything? Um, you could have so little traffic that having two of everything is, you know, overkill. You're spending twice as much money on something that you don't need. There's also a consideration of uptime. Um, how much downtime can they actually withstand? Um, they're always going to tell you that they need like 99 nines uptime and that they absolutely cannot be down for a certain amount of time. 
um, they just won't have it. But then if you actually start breaking that down and asking them how much is an hour of downtime worth to you? Like how much will you lose? Um, I've talked to some customers that have absolutely no idea what their time is worth. They just know that it has to be up all the time. Um, there's also considerations for, do you have maintenance windows? Um, is there a couple of hours every weekend that you're going to assign for non SLA downtime? Um, taking those kind of things into consideration for, do we need multiple ports in the network cards? Do we need multiple network cards? Do we need multiple top of rack switches or top of rack routers, whatever you decide to go with in your configuration? Um, how much of that do you actually need in your environment? Um, are we gonna go with splitting our uplinks into our VDS? Um, you just have to kind of take into consideration for what you're doing, how much traffic you're actually going to be pushing, how much downtime can you consider, um, and you can kind of design for how much you actually need. Um, I've worked in some designs where it's been, you have an uplink from each one of the two top of rack switches into different network cards so that you can have a top of rack switch die, you can have a NIC card die. And even down to you can have one of the ports on one of the NIC cards die. Um, but I've also had it to where everything is just one all the way up the chain. Uh, it really depends on what you need for your environment. Yeah, absolutely. I think like I think you kind of hinted around it, but it really goes back to the SLA, right? So what mm -hmm. is the SLA and what does the and more importantly, what does the SLA cover? Right? Because your SLA may only cover, for example, your uh, compute infrastructure, and it may not even count against your network infrastructure at all. Um, or of course, Absolutely it, right. it may be fully encompassing. And then if they do need, for example, 99.99%, uh, then you are looking at N plus one at a minimum. Um, you mm -hmm. may have a requirement that says like no single point of failure. <laughs> so then if you have two, uh, you know, uplinks on a V switch <laughs> that are coming from the same PCI device, you have a single point of failure, right? So that it's documenting potentially that as a risk if that's no other choice, uh, if you have no other choice but to do that, uh, documenting that as a risk and then mitigating it, right? So for example, having uh, spare PCI devices on the shelf. Um, but I think you said something really important, really key, and I'd like to emphasize that. It, it really, you said it really depends on what you're trying to protect yourself against. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really going back to having like a good business impact analysis, right? Knowing exactly what it is you are trying to protect yourself from. And uh, I think that's one big shift when you say you're protecting the business. Um, that's a big shift in mindset from going from say the VCAP deploy exams to the VCAP design exams. Um, you're not just necessarily thinking about what does this nerd knob do and how do I know when to press that nerd knob? You're actually having to take the business into account and make decisions based on that. SLA is, I would say everything. It's not necessarily everything, but it's, it's important. Um, you've got customers that when you start a design, they'll say, I need N plus one, but they have no idea what N, what N plus one actually means in terms of cost or downtime. They just know I want an extra one of everything. How does N plus one actually equate in nine? Uh, <laughs> what does it actually cost the customer for that downtime? Yeah, I mean, that's my favorite is I hear that a lot. I'll hear, well, we need five nines of uptime, right? And so then you go, okay, well, that loosely translates to, uh, you know, no more than five minutes of downtime in a year. Let's start pricing this out. Now we're looking at synchronous replication. We're looking at multi-site, you know, and it has, can only, has to be within a certain distance. And then you start telling them how much it's going to cost. And they're like, yeah, maybe we don't need that after all. Yep. So I've used the, the example already now that basically you design all these no single points of failure and then it gets to the point where you're like, all right, so let's go ahead and talk about the second site. And they're like, uh, What's we don't have money for that right now. <laughs> so you end up with a scenario where you're perfectly redundant all the way up through to the point where if that place becomes a smoking hole in the ground, you've got nothing. Yep. And you know, and like I'm, I'm, from the New Orleans area. And so when you go, oh yeah, we're only gonna have a single site, you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> or my favorite is we're gonna have a, a DR site in Houston or Baton Rouge. You're like, uh 
Yeah, business and everywhere Dallas. where if New Orleans gets taken out again, so is Baton Rouge. <laughs> yeah, or like Katrina, where you have uh, Katrina take out New Orleans, and then Rita comes by a week later and takes out Houston, which was yeah. a DR site. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you really have to feel out the customer. And I, I've i seen people talk in terms of, do you need N plus one or do you need N plus two or how many nines do you need? Um, and I really think that's a bad place to start in terms of trying to plan redundancy and stuff like that. Because a lot of customers, they, they understand what four nines means, but they may not understand what their business is worth. They don't have a dollar value assigned to say, well, for every one of those nines, how much is it gonna cost? Um, and there's a lot of companies out there that have no idea what their time is actually worth. They don't have a number assigned for, for every one hour, I lose X amount of dollars. And that's really important in stuff like this. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's where having that solid business impact analysis comes in. It's what are you trying to protect yourself against? And if that were to happen, if you did have like a ransomware event or a hurricane or whatever, uh, and you're down for an hour, how much money are you losing in an hour? How much money are you losing per minute? Right. And that's actually one of the things that like with NSX that I talk about a lot, um, micro segmentation with our distributed firewall is probably our biggest use case. And a lot of the times when I'm talking to customers, I use companies like Target that are obvious, you know, for that. And it's one of those things where my question to them, to the customer is, what is your brand worth? And there's a lot of companies that have absolutely no idea what their brand or their time or anything is worth until something happens. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, we were down for three hours and we lost half a million dollars. So now we know what a one hour's worth of time is worth. So it's just one of those things where you have to know what the business is doing and how the business is operating in order to make these kinds of decisions correctly. And being able to say, I have no single point of failures is all well and good, but did you spend three times what you should have or what it was worth to do so? Yeah, I agree. And um, so a second ago, I also talked about leaf spine architecture. Um, I do have my redundant Pizza Hut sign, which I thought was hilarious. But then I, uh, over on the right here, um, to show a little bit of redundancy with Leaf Spine, you've got your uh, core routers at the top. In the middle, you've got your spine switches. And then you've got your leaf switches at the bottom. And that kind of shows that you've got multiple paths to get out of each of that. If you look at the bottom tier, <coughs> sorry, those would basically be your top racks. And if you look, you've got four connections going out of each one of those. If you use something like equal cost multipathing, which is essentially just saying, I've got four different paths that all cost the same, quote unquote, I can use whichever one. If I lose one of those paths, I can just use another one. Um, that's definitely a good way of doing network redundancy, and that's a very, very popular network architecture for greenfield data center environments. Um, it's been popularized by Cisco, um, ACI uses leaf spine and all that, but you can also do leaf spine without going the ACI route. Uh, it's just a really good, good way of kind of upgrading your network and taking a lot of the STP problems and single point of failure problems and stuff like that. Out. So moving on, analyzing design for inclusion of network IO control or NIOC. Um, this is super, super important when it comes to networking designs, at least it has been for the ones that I've been working on. <clears throat> Network IO control allows you to kind of, I would say it's basically like a reservation like you can do for compute, but it allows you to set up a reservation, so to speak, for your network traffic. Um, and this is on your virtual distributed switch. So you can have all of this stuff on it, such as vMotion management, uh, IP storage, fault tolerance, VM traffic, and you can set up shares for it. And it allows you to kind of prioritize your traffic, kind of sort of like quality of service and physical networking, where you can kind of set a priority for what gets the most shares, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to make sure that your vMotion traffic is always you know available if you need to be able to vMotion things around a lot. Um, management traffic is important. You don't want to kind of get involved with that. 
but you also want to make sure that you're not stepping on VM traffic if you start to have network contention. You can kind of tell it which is more important. You can also set limits to where you can say, my vMotion gets 15 shares, but I also want to limit that to 1500 megabits. So no matter what, even if it's running away, it's always capped at 1500. Um, this is something that I see a lot in terms of using IP storage in designs. Due to the fact that you want to make sure that you've always got enough traffic for that, but you're not stepping on anybody else's toes. Uh, do you see that a lot, Rebecca? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think uh, network I.O. control is really important in uh, infrastructures that are using 10 gig uh, and, and in some infrastructures that are using 40 gig where uh, limits really become kind of important here where you go, great, uh, vMotion should not be able to use more than two gigabit per second. How do I do that? Um, and network I.O. control becomes the answer there. Um, you, you know, prior, I, personally, I think, I, I, you know, I try to avoid reservations unless there's a specific use case for them just because of all the complications that reservations introduce. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, shares too as well. Like you could say, for example, um, well, my IP storage traffic is more important than management, but virtual machine traffic is more important than both of them. Well, how do you do that? Right? Again, network IO control, you'll just configure the shares. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of, uh, way back when, before the distributed switch, before NIOC and all that, um, people were basically designing around this manually. Um, I saw a lot of times that people were doing completely separate uplinks to s different standard switches for, you know, storage or VM traffic or, you know, uh, management traffic and stuff like that. And essentially saying, well, for vMotion and all that, we're just going to give it its own link. So no matter what, it can use, you know, the full way back then, 100 meg link or gig link or what have you. Um, but but these days I'm seeing it a lot, um, especially in like 10 gig, 40 gig and all those real high throughput um, environments where you're essentially just taking and throwing a couple of 10 gig links at it and then using network IO control to kind of slice that apart as opposed to saying, well, this one link is just for management traffic and this one link is for vMotion traffic. Um, for example, in one of the environments that I worked on over at Dell Services, we had a one gig environment and a 10 gig environment. Our one gig environment, every single ESX host had 12 one gig lines to it. And all of those were kind of split up into their own specific uh, virtual switches. Um, so we were sitting there splitting the traffic off physically using 12 different Ethernet cables. In the 10 gig environment, we had just four 10 gig links straight into each one of those hosts using. At that time, we had two separate uh, distributed switches, but in order to make sure that everything was split off logically, we were using network I.O. control for that. So being able to know what use cases you have for network I.O. control or not, um, I've seen it not used specifically for manageability, um, and I've also seen it specifically used because there was a specific SLA set on being able to be motion or having management available all the time or making sure that no matter what management and vMotion never stepped on VM traffic. Knowing what kind of requirements and stuff you have going into that is again how you're going to start to make those decisions for which uh, if you're going to use network IO control and how you're going to use it. So determining use case for multiple TCP IP stacks. Where's the meme Tim? Where is the meme? I had absolutely no idea what to put there. I tried to think of the most smart ass comment I could and I just I, I couldn't find something good enough to use. So I've where's never, the meme? Never been so disappointed in you in my life. <laughs> I know. I'm a failure. And I'm really upset that I didn't know there was ways to get gifts in here. Otherwise it would have just been like gift city in here. So uh, having to use JPEGs really limited me from my standard responses. So multiple TCP IP stacks. Um, up until semi-recently, no matter what you did, there was just flat out one TCP IP stack in an ESX host. Um, you could have multiple VM kernels, but they always used the same gateway. Um, 
nowadays you can set up multiple TCP IP stacks and really a good reason for doing that, um, obviously I'm gonna throw the NSX flag up here, um, having VTEPs in your host, generally with the way that we have those set up, you're gonna have VTEPs going to a separate gateway. Uh, you don't have to, but that's generally the way we see it. So having all of your management traffic and stuff like that going through one TCP IP stack and your VTEPs going through another stack um, is the most common way of configuring that. Um, another huge use case that I've seen for that is vMotion and putting vMotion onto its own network. Um, there's also vSAN traffic, putting that onto its own network. Um, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, what kind of requirements you have, um, if you're using a technology like NSX or vSAN, um, you'll kind of think about, do I need multiple TCP IP stacks? Um, and go ahead and set that up for your design. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's like the big thing with like vMotion, for example, is do you need it to be routable? Mm -hmm. right? Do you need an, a, a, an IP interface or a VM kernel to be routable? If the answer is no, then you probably don't need a separate TCP IP stack. You're fine using the management one. That's the default one. Uh, it just won't be routable unless it's using the same subnet as management, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if there's no use case for that, well, then you probably don't need this. So when I've actually seen designs where vMotion is offloaded to a completely unroutable network and it just can't get anywhere. It's all internal. It's all east-west. Um, so depending on how you want that traffic to go, um, if you're doing, say, what is it, uh, cross vCenter vMotion and stuff like that, where you kind of need it to talk out, um, that's really the kind of use cases where you would need to say, yeah, well, I need it to have a gateway or not. Um, <clears throat> VTEPs for NSX, you can absolutely do it where there's no gateway for that, or you can use a gateway. It all depends on your design and how you're going to be implementing that technology. 8.43, so we have a little bit of time. Do we have any questions or anything like that? I guess I... Wait till you check your Twitter check. later. You're getting harassed. Am I really? Oh, yeah. I didn't start it. Uh, maybe I started it. I don't know. 52. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> but okay. Don't, don't worry about... The first about thing I see is Tom. Way to go, Tom. Um, but don't worry about Tom. Just keep going. <laughs> Okay, so based on given functional requirements for each service, determine the most appropriate networking technologies for design and implement the services based on required infrastructure quality. Um, here I said ramps specifically so I could use a purpose or a picture. Um, I usually use ampers. Literally, it's, it's all the same. Um, that's going to be your... Um, <clears throat> Recoverability, availability, manageability, uh, security, and all that. So, I was introduced to the acronym PARMS by Sean Massey. Now, I prefer to always say PARMS because I think of parm, I think of a, like a nice uh, chicken parmesan sandwich. Mm. Mm. I like that. Me That's too. a good one. I, I actually haven't heard it said that way before. Me neither. Shout out, Sean. <laughs> yeah, go, Sean. So. Based on given functional requirements uh, for each service, so uh, determining the most appropriate networking technologies for the design. You're going to talk to networking guys that are going to say, I want to use the latest and greatest. My Cisco guy came in and they told me that I have to use ACI. We have 9K switches and they have APIC and we're going to use ACI. Is ACI really good for that design? Are you going to use ACI to its fullest ability? Are you going to use it in NXOS mode and just do spine length? Um, you really have to make sure that the design decisions you're making fit for the functional requirements that you have. Um, sure, there may be requirements that you have where you specifically need to make a design choice that fits for something like that. But you have to ask yourself, do we need this or do we just want this now? That's not to say that picking a specific technology based on the fact that you want it isn't going to fit one of your requirements because it's absolutely possible. But you need to make sure that you're making design choices based off the specific requirements or constraints that you have and not based off what you want to do because it's cool. Um, this is 
a really, really big deal in terms of making correct design decisions. Um, especially if you go through and you start doing BCDX and stuff like that, because if you make a design decision um, based off the fact that you think it's awesome and you can't fully justify it back down to all of your requirements, you're going to get torn apart. Um, I would know that because I've gotten torn apart for design decisions that I've made just on the fact that I wanted to use a specific technology. Um, it absolutely has to fit. Um, implementing the services based on required infrastructure qualities. So are you making that decision based on availability requirements that you have, uh, manageability requirements? So ACI, um, it can definitely be a highly available physical infrastructure, but are you picking it for availability, which it does have, but in terms of manageability, how manageable is it in real life? Um, it can definitely overload you. Um, the same question or the same can be done for NSX. NSX can be highly available, but in terms of manageability, does it fit? It can absolutely be manageable um, in the same way that any other you know, physical fabric could. Um, you just have to make sure that everything is lining up for the decisions that you make. I had a notes page and I lost it. Oops. Okay. Mm -mm. Analyzing design for appropriate network teaming, huh? Team? Yeah, we got it. And failover solution. I just want everybody to know what the best team on the face of the planet is. That's the worst, the worst joke tonight. <laughs> that is the best joke tonight. Who was that? It's Ariel. Oh, come on, man. No, no, this is the best joke tonight. I just want you all to know that this is the best one. Come on, I know it was a stretch for team, but come on, I got this. You're the only one laughing, my friend. That should be your answer. I don't appreciate where this has gone. <laughs> all right, so uh, when you analyze your design for appropriate network teaming and failover solutions, whoop, we've talked about um, some of the different failover policies and stuff like that. Knowing exactly what use cases fit some of those. Um, do you have an application that your traffic has to come in and out of the same thing? Um, can you have asynchronous situations where you're going in one link and out the other? Uh, knowing exactly what the workload you're designing for does is really how you answer those questions. Um, and that brings up a point that I wanted to mention that really when it comes down to making designs and stuff like that your workloads are the most important when you're an admin messing with nerd knobs doing all this kind of stuff making sure the infrastructure is up everything is all well and good when you start making design choices and doing designs it's all about the workload it's all about the application it's all about the business <clears throat> so you really have to know exactly what that looks like to start making choices on do I need to load balance my links? Do I need to have it just explicit failover so all traffic is going through one to the other? Um, I've absolutely seen designs where explicit failover is used um, just based on the fact that they had enough throughput for one link. Um, a downside to that would be that there is a tiny bit of downtime when that link fails over. Um, depending on how everything is set up will determine how long that is. Generally, it's not long, but it is there. Determine network security and firewall requirements for a virtual network design. So this is one that I talk about a lot in my daily job um, with security and firewall. Um, in your data centers these days, most of the time you are taking traffic and you're physically steering it to a firewall. Um, you're hairpinning traffic even if the two VMs are on the same host. You're taking that traffic from one VM you're sending it out to a firewall, be it on the edge or somewhere in your environment, and then you're hairpinning the traffic right back to the destination VM. Um, and that's only if you're doing east-west firewalling and stuff like that. Uh, network security is by far one of the most important things that we've uh, seen these days, um, whether it be for things like PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance, and stuff like that. Um, you really have to take all of that into consideration when making design decisions. 
there's a uh, a big deal where with things like PCI and DMZ and stuff like that, where there has to be physical separation. So you see infrastructures where you've got entire stacks of physical networking gear from the top all the way down that are air gapped or split off from the top down so that you know for a fact when your auditor comes in and takes a look, they say, yep, those are split, those are split. Um, then you know, you're good. But with newer technologies like NSX, you can have different zones existing even on the same host using things like our distributed firewall where you're able to kind of split those zones across without having to actually physically split them. So you kind of need to take into consideration what technologies you're going to be implementing or what technologies you have the ability to implement to make those decisions. If you've got a series of auditors or internal compliance that says you absolutely have to split the networks off physically, then you know you're going to be making a decision where you may even have separate clusters in your environment that go all the way down for PCI and non-PCI. Um, you need to think of traffic steering requirements for do we have the ability to use a virtual firewall system like NSX or Palo Alto or something like that, or are we going to be steering traffic in and out of hosts um, at that point in time, if you are using physical firewalls in your environment, you're going to be passing all of this traffic back and forth. So you also need to think about network throughput. Do you have enough bandwidth to handle all that traffic? If you're using something like NSX, since we're doing in-kernel firewalling, you're kind of taking off a lot of that load from your physical environment. So you may not need as big of physical firewalls in your environment, or you may not need as uh, 40 gig when 10 gig will do. You really need to make sure that you're taking all of this into account when making those decisions. Based on service level requirements, uh, determine appropriate network performance characteristics. Um, <clears throat> this is, in my experience with working towards VCDX so far, probably the most painful point when it comes down to SLAs and network performance and things like that. Because you can say, I've got an SLA of blah, 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 blah. And I've got two sites that are here. Um, the question is, how big of a link do you actually need in order to replicate that traffic across to have the kind of SLA that you need? Um, <clears throat> uh, this brings in uh, one of the least favorite things of mine, which is math, <laughs> where you're actually calculating how fast can I replicate data or how fast can I pass traffic across in order to meet my SLA. And you'll definitely come into environments where customers will say, I have an X SLA of blank. But then they tell you, oh, well, we've only got a 100 meg circuit and it goes from the US to Australia, but we need a zero RTO and a zero RPO. It's, it's not physically possible. You have to absolutely take into account how far are these different sites or different places? How much bandwidth do we actually have to work with? Um, is it dark fiber? Is it MPLS? Um, being able to quantify for sure when I build this together and I start pushing traffic and data across, will I physically be able to meet my SLA? Um, distance alone is a very, very huge factor. Um, with a lot of standard links, if you're going, say, from somewhere like the US to Australia, it's so far that you're literally constrained by the speed of light. You can only pass things so fast across that kind of distance. Um, so you'll need to know exactly what the traffic is looking like and what your links and uh, things are looking like when you start to build and try to meet SLAs. You can't force something to go faster or with more throughput than you've got available to you. So what you're saying is you have to do the math? Yes. And that's and your favorite subject? I hate math. I'm so bad at math, like so bad. And that's been a, uh, a contention point for me in doing VCDX is that I'm so bad at math. <laughs> 
I'm having to double and triple check and do all this normal math and try to memorize things. And it's just, I hate saying that because, you know, when you work in computers, you're like, oh, yeah, math. No, I'm awful at math. I'm so bad at it. Um, but luckily, in the real world, you can use calculators. So, ha. Huh. <laughs> Calculator and VCDX. <laughs> what? Yes. I hope you're using a calculator, Tim. <laughs> All right, so my favorite picture in this entire thing, other than the Dallas Cowboys logo, giving, uh, given a current network configuration, as well as technical requirements and constraints, determine the appropriate virtual switch solution. Now, this comes straight from the blueprint, and I hate to say that I kind of take, a, not offense to it, but uh, I don't agree with how it is, because there's the vSphere standard switch, there's the vSphere distributed switch, there's NSX and there's hybrid solutions. Um, NSX is not a virtual switch, period. It's not. Do we have logical switching? Yes. NSX is not a virtual switch. NSX merely augments your distributed switches to say, not only can you make layer two decisions, now you can make layer three decisions. While you have that packet bust open, go ahead and check it against this firewall table while you're in there. Um, there was a, uh, press release that we put out here recently that um, finally dropped the hammer on something that we've all been waiting for for a long time, and that's third-party virtual switches. They are gone. Um, that's as of 6.5 update 2. Uh, update 1 will allow it. Update 2 will not. Um, just to cut a common misconception, this is not a direct slight on Cisco. While they are the biggest third-party virtual switch company, there are other companies like HPE and IBM that are doing it that are also going to be cut out. Uh, we are going the one or two switch if you can't open virtual switch, and uh, we're going to make it work the best. <clears throat> so in terms of the VCAP here, you have to look at, of course, your requirements and constraints, all of your current networking configurations, and say, which switch am I going to use? Now, there's um, obvious differences between the standard switch and the distributed switch. Standard switches are only on one host. Distributed switches are across multiple hosts. Um, that obviously for distributed switches fits a, a, a very common requirement of make it easily manageable. Because of the fact that you're only managing quote unquote one switch, you're doing that from the vCenter environment and then it's pushing down the configuration to all the hosts so that it does exist on all the hosts. Um, there is a manageability concern in there or a risk where if you lose your vCenter server, you won't be able to make changes to the distributed switch. Um, you can definitely work to try to mitigate that risk, but it all depends on what works for you. Um, distributed switch is the most common these days. Um, but I also have seen recent designs where virtual machine traffic was put on distributed switches and management vMotion traffic was put onto standard switches. Um, it all depends on what you need based on your requirements and constraints. So when you're taking this test, obviously if you need to make a decision between a standard switch or a distributed switch um, or NSX or whatever they call a hybrid solution, um, <clears throat> you need to take into account what are the requirements and constraints for that. Um, do you have a manageability requirement? Um, distributed switch definitely helps with making things e easily manageable as long as you can mitigate the risk of having vCenter down for a little bit, um, adding vSphere HA to that or something to reboot it, or the new vSphere or vCenter HA component. Um, hybrid solutions, I, while I do see that, I don't see that a lot, um, especially with people using network I.O. control. I've seen it where it's pretty much just thrown into a distributed switch most of the time and using network IO control to split things up. Um, obviously, NSX is the greatest thing ever. Everybody should use it. Everybody should buy it. Um, go buy it right now. Get out your credit card and go for it. I would love that. Um, <clears throat> but it definitely does not fit every use case. If you've got a tiny environment, you may not necessarily need you know, logical switching and logical routing. Um, if you're a tiny environment, but you've got the requirement to have networks spun up and down extremely quickly, NSX can be a fix for that. Um, even in small environments, we can definitely fit in with our distributed firewall product. If you have security requirements or security constraints to work with, 
uh, it really depends on whatever's presented for you in the exam for which dis uh, decisions you should make. Based on existing logical design, determine appropriate host networking resources. So I've said network a million times in this. Um, just because you can put a bunch of 40 gig links in your host, do you really need that? Or can you get by with 10 gig links or even one gig links? Um, going through and figuring out exactly what kind of requirements you have. Um, let's say you've got a really heavy need for VM traffic, but your management and vMotion traffic won't be that big. You might be able to get away with using 10 gig links for your VM traffic and then putting management and vMotion on one gig links. It may be your traffic patterns may be the opposite. So you may put your VM traffic on one gig links and then have your management and vMotion on 10 gig links. You may put everything on 10 gig links. You may put everything on one gig links. Um, you have to take a look at exactly what kind of requirements you've got to tell you what kind of networking choices you would need for host networking resources. Um, I would love to tell everybody that they need 10 gig and 40 gig because it's fantastic, um, especially in a small environment. You're doing vMotions as fast as you can snap your fingers. But that may be a waste of money. It may be a waste of resources because you're only using, say, 200 megs of traffic for vMotion. So putting it on a 10 gig link is kind of a waste of resource. Um, generally doing an assessment of the network will tell you what kind of traffic you're actually looking at. Um, if you're, say, currently using a few 1 gig links now, looking forward and saying, well, I also need to project for three or you know, 12 months worth of growth, you may end up going through and saying, well, I'm just going to go ahead and use 10 gig links now because in that growth period, we're going to go ahead and get to where we need to be to properly utilize those 10 gig links. Uh, definitely everything you need to kind of take down. And if you haven't noticed, not just today, but in every single series here for this VCAP design exam so far, there are 50 billion different design decisions you can make. Every single little nerd knob or choice you can make um, is something that you need to be able to link back to your requirements, to your constraints and all that. Um, so you really have to keep a holistic view on everything, budget, application, uh, performance and all that when making these kinds of decisions, not just saying, well, I've got you know this much traffic, so I'm gonna use this kind of switch maybe that doesn't necessarily link back to another one of your requirements or it completely goes against one of your other requirements. So you kind of have to make those decisions based on everything holistically. Properly apply converged networking considering VMware best practice. So this is your favorite best practices word, but it's straight out of the blueprint. So how do you feel about that? Not a fan. I got to tell you, not a fan. Well, unfortunately, there is uh, a billion white papers out there that says VMware and best practices on it. Um, so this is uh, one of the blueprint topics. It's my least favorite. Um, converged networking. We hear converged a lot these days with hyper-converged, and that's just basically shoving everything into one box and making it work. Um, but there is definitely a big difference between hyper-converged infrastructure and converged networking. Converged networking is using your one physical networking for both LAN traffic and storage traffic. Um, you see this a lot in <coughs> uh, things like the um, UCS chassis and stuff like that. Um, using things like fiber channel over ethernet and when you're doing converged networking considerations, what the big thing with that is going to be traffic. How much traffic do you have going through? Um, doing a study to say, how much of my land traffic do I have? How much storage traffic do I have? I need a link that's big enough for that. What kind of performance do I get from doing that? Um, do I have a requirement that says I have to use this or I don't necessarily have to use this? Um, a lot of times you'll see where there's an aging fiber channel infrastructure 
And I've seen customers that just want to try to get away from that as opposed to refreshing that hardware. They want to go for an IP storage so they can make a design decision to say use 10 gig networking or 40 gig networking infrastructure so that they can do their storage traffic and their land traffic all on the same physical equipment as opposed to having a physical networking infrastructure and a fiber channel infrastructure for storage. Um, there's also manageability that you can uh, decisions you can make to say, well, I don't want to manage two different fabrics, so I'm going to make a manageability decision to make a converged infrastructure to where I'm doing storage and networking all in the same platform. Um, when you're going through and you're doing the CAP design exam, you may have some requirements that will link back and you'll go, hey, I know I need to take and mix this and use the same fabric. So you'll build the design based on that. And it looks like we're seven minutes over here, but I think that's it. <laughs> Finish. Fin. We're done. So one follow-up question. Um, what's the square root of 64? False. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, before we close it out, I want to turn it over. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I haven't seen any uh, question so much, but you do have some Go Cowboys support from uh, Cheston. All right. He's My the man. only one. Um, so, uh, but if anybody else has any questions, uh, you know, please feel free to go ahead and type it out. And we're opening the microphone. Dun, dun, dun. It's going to take me forever to go back and read all these Twitter <laughs> comments, man. Oh my God, you guys. <laughs> welcome. Uh, so? You got a shout out from Darshan, and this is a really worth a, a worth it session. So thank you, Darshan. Appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. So I think uh, no other questions. So I guess we'll go ahead and call it a day. So thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording so I can uh, keep talking smack to you. <laughs>